Hey, this is Derek, and listen to Skepticality for Tuesday, January. Hey, this is Derek, and listen to Skepticality, an official podcast of the Skeptic Society, for Tuesday, February 14th, 2012. Welcome back to another episode of Skepticality, here to bring you news and interviews with scientists and skeptics from around the world and all walks of life for the promotion of critical thinking and science! Today I give you another program chock full of content. We will discuss some of the current fuss surrounding Foxconn, the manufacturer of much of today's tech, and then a little bit about everybody's favorite playwright, Shakespeare. But before any of that, let's find out a little bit about this episode's Skeptic History with Tim Farley. It's time to spend a few minutes in Skeptic History for February 2012. I'm Tim Farley of whatstheharm.net. Each edition, we look into history to remember key events of science and skepticism. This edition, we have tombs, mass vaccinations, and bunkum. Two interesting anniversaries relating to burial both occur on February 16th. It was on that day in 1923 that the burial chamber of King Tutankhamun was opened after the tomb's discovery the previous November. The idea of a pharaoh's curse was brought to wide attention when Lord Carnarvon died on April 5th, six weeks after the opening of the tomb. Over 60 years later, on February 16, 1989, the journal Nature published a paper titled Radiocarbon Dating of the Shroud of Turin. It was the result of a multi-year process of sampling and testing of the famous fabric. The authors wrote that the tests provided conclusive evidence that the linen of the Shroud of Turin is medieval. Vaccinations are among the most effective tools of science-based medicine. They've saved the lives of millions. They are most effective when a large portion of a population has been vaccinated. This is what we call herd immunity. In efforts to achieve herd immunity, compulsory vaccination laws have been passed many times, always against objections. During a serious smallpox outbreak in Massachusetts in 1902, a minister named Henning Jacobson refused vaccination and was ordered to pay a $5 fine. He challenged the state's vaccination law in court and took his case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. The court decided in Jacobson v. Massachusetts on February 20, 1905, and the justices wrote that although the Constitution grants individual liberties, they are not absolute and can be limited when the safety of the general public may demand. Some skeptics use the term debunk or debunking quite commonly. These words actually have a fairly recent origin. Like many forms of nonsense, their story starts in the United States Congress. In 1820, a long and contentious debate over what later became known as the Missouri Compromise had gone on for quite some time. On February 25, 1820, Felix Walker, who represented Buncombe County, North Carolina, stood to speak right before a vote was to be called. He was known for giving rambling, pointless speeches, and no one present wanted to hear yet another one, particularly not then. He insisted that he just wanted to speak for Buncombe, but was shouted down anyway. He later had his speech read into the congressional record, and it was published in the newspaper. Consistent with his prior speeches, it was complete nonsense. And so, by 1828, the phrase, to speak for Buncombe, became to mean that you were speaking nonsense. Later, the word was shortened to bunk and spelled with a K. Adding the prefix to make it debunk did not occur until the year 1923 in a book by William E. Woodward. That book was called Bunk. Until then, that's it for this visit to Skeptic History. 
Links to additional material are in the show notes, including the locations online where I post a new skeptic history fact every day. Thanks again, Tim. So there's been a lot of fuss lately about the now infamous company, Foxconn, the manufacturer of much of the guts of today's electronics. If you have one of Apple's popular devices, the iPad, iPhone, etc., it likely has components built in China by Foxconn. Lately, there's been a groundswell of support for boycotting companies who get their parts made at Foxconn plants due to reports of suicides and poor working conditions. Since we here at Skepticality like to think critically about these issues, I turn to my good friend, Tom Merritt, popular and respected technology reporter and a professional in the world of technology today, who's the host of Tech News Today and other tech-related blogs and audio shows for Leo Laporte's Twit Network to discuss what the deal is with Foxconn and to see what we need to do to separate the facts from the pop fiction. <laughs> Hey, Tom. Hello, Derek. So, you know, at some point I knew I had to get you on the show. I have you at our DragonCon Skeptic Track for the past few years, and you've had me on your shows. Now you have Tech News Today, but before that it was uh, Buzz Out Loud? Yeah. Buzz Out Loud, that yeah. Was it. Great to have you on. Well, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me back. And uh, I thought about the fact I needed to have you on, and suddenly, around the same time, something came up that I knew that you would be a good person to have on the show about because people went crazy about the Apple boycott of products because the suicides at the Foxconn plants. And then I scratched the surface a little bit and some other people did too and realized that, you know, we'd be boycotting something a little insane once you do the numbers. Yeah, I mean... It- I, I am a little conflicted because there is there is poor working conditions at Foxconn, and that's absolutely documented. And I, I don't want anyone to come off as supporting bad working conditions. However, it's uh, it's about evaluating these working conditions in the broader context, not just saying, oh, there's some bad working conditions, and Apple pays for parts to be made at that plant, and therefore Apple supports bad working conditions. If if you're going to use that metric, you have to use it against all of the companies in the world, and you're going to find that very few companies in the world don't at some point pay for a service or a part to be made at some factory that has some kind of unsatisfactory working conditions. That doesn't just go for China. That goes for Europe and the United States as <laughs> yeah. well. And that was actually one of the things I noticed that some of these numbers, when you actually boil them down, there's actually more suicide-related events happening in American factories, which we don't have many many of anymore, but we still have some. And actually, our number is higher than China. That and that's the big thing, right? Is uh, Foxconn is an enormous uh, employer. They have I I I can't remember exactly, but they uh, have 1.2 million. I think more than that. Yeah. Uh, uh, employed by Foxconn in China. So when you look at the number of suicides at Foxconn, it's it's large and, and and it's alarming. And I can see where seeing the number of suicides, you would say, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, or, uh, it's, it's China, it's communist, it's a campus. Uh, you hear stories about people who never leave the factory. They have, they have uh, dormitories there. What are they doing to these people? Is this the coal mines of, of the 1800s and early 1900s all over again? And, and in some senses, yes. It can be considered like that, but that suicide number is not the evidence of it. And you have to take into account that in the general population, you're going to have people commit suicide for many different reasons. Unfortunately, that's just true. And Forbes has a a good infographic where they show that the number of suicides per million workers in Foxconn uh, was 18 overall. The number of suicides per million Chinese citizens is 220. Yeah. So if you're going, there's a wider problem at work here, which is 
Chinese people committing suicide, which is a subset of the problem of people committing suicide. And you also have a lower rate at Foxconn. So there may be something, and this is jumping to conclusions, but there may be something to the fact that people who are gainfully employed in some way are less likely to commit suicide. That's worth investigating. Yeah, also, I also when I digged around to the families, there's people who actually actually uproot and move close to Fox Tan because they're renowned for being one of the best employers to the Chinese people because they've paid for almost everything. Yeah, and, and there's some more stats that, that, you know, bear out the working conditions argument. Uh, seven fatal workplace injuries at Foxconn per million workers versus 35 fatal workplace injuries per million workers in the United States at large. Uh, it's a little bit of an apples and oranges comparison because you're looking at one particular employer in a different country than an entire country. But it's it shows that Foxconn's fatal workplace injuries, suicides or not, don't seem to be alarming, alarmingly high, at least when you look at, at that number. So, um, again, it's all in context that you have to take this stuff. In China, Foxconn probably is one of the best places to work because China is a much different place than the United States. Uh, China doesn't have the kind of service level jobs and and hospitality jobs and 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 essentially the the sort of cushy jobs that we're used to in the United States. Not that every job in the United States is cushy, but we have a lot of opportunities uh, for jobs that are not nearly fatal. A lot of office type jobs. They don't have that in China. And so you're going to have people working in factories and those are going to be considered good jobs versus not having a job or hard labor on a farm that pays very little. And they're going to be in factories where working conditions are dangerous. And that's always true of factories. Do I think that Foxconn and other factories in China and Southeast Asia uh, treat their workers ideally? No, I don't think they do. It's, again, it's all, all a matter of what you're coming from, where you're going to. There certainly should be pressure applied to Foxconn to improve working conditions, but it should be based on a reasonable assessment of what the current working conditions are, rather than an emotional reaction of someone committed suicide. You know, these are blood diamonds. These are your your, your electronics are are you know are are killing people. The blood. Yeah, sh- your electronics are killing people. Your 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 furniture is killing people. Your clothing's killing people. I mean, great, buy local, but you're not going to find a lot of people making chips locally. Blood phones. Blood phones. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see the movie now. Yeah, it's. Uh, I again, I, I, I'm sympathetic to to the problem, and I think coming to Apple and saying, you know what, you're the you're the leader here. You make the most money. You have the highest profile. You can put some pressure on to help make workplace better. I think that's fine, but let's do it in a reasonable fashion. Let's actually call attention to the things that might actually be wrong rather than jumping to conclusions that this is per- the worst place on earth. It absolutely is not. I imagine not. There's some people in some inner African countries who would kind of be mad at you if you said that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for, for one thing, and you've got a, a, a factory that's providing jobs that do pay wages. And they also uh, provide food and housing. Yeah, and and that's a double-edged sword. I mean, the coal mines of of West Virginia provided food and housing as well. And they re- restricted you from shopping anywhere outside the company store. And they, they attached your wages and all kinds of horrible uh, abuses. And, and there may be similar types of abuses going on in Foxconn, but we have those kinds of conditions arise because the conditions that the workers are in before they take the job are worse. That doesn't excuse the conditions, but you don't want to just get rid of the factory. You don't want to just get rid of the coal mine and send people back into abject poverty. What you want to do is put pressure on the coal mine or the factory or whatever to begin to change their ways and improve those conditions so that everybody wins. So basically if the take what is if we all boycott Apple products, a lot of people will then be put back in poverty where they don't have anything. It's it's poss- It would be possible. I mean, theoretically, if everyone just decided to stop buying Apple products, though, I'm not sure what they would buy. Would they just stop buying all electronics? Yeah, I know, because 
I, could, I guess Foxconn makes almost all the Dell products and most of the HP motherboards. And I mean, it's not just Apple. And uh, other factories and other companies in China uh, have similar conditions to Foxconn. They're just not as large, so they don't they don't come under the headlines. But they they they're all working in in similar ways, and. I don't know enough about it to say there isn't one factory that's doing it much better than the others that we could point to. That would be a great thing for someone to do is to say, hey, Foxconn, you need to be like this. Hey, Apple, why don't you push Foxconn to be more like this example? But I haven't seen that example touted. And the fact of the matter is all of the manufacturing of electronics is moving into Asia, whether it's China or Taiwan or elsewhere. Nokia just uh, announced they're laying off 4,000 workers in plants uh, around the world because they're moving the assembly of smartphones to Asia. So b- boycotts of Apple might be good to nudge Apple into doing something to improve conditions, but uh, you're going to have to boycott buying electronics if you really wanted to punish China. I'm not sure that that's called for necessarily. Mm, yeah, I would probably have to agree with that when you look at all the numbers. So thank you so much for jumping on the show. And yeah, tell everybody they, where they can find you and all of your stuff. Uh, well, TomMerritt.com is, is my website where I uh, post everything that I do. And if you're interested in t- more technology news, uh, Tech News Today is every day. It's live at 2.30 Pacific, uh, 5.30 Eastern at live.twit.tv. Or you can get it at twit.tv uh, as a podcast as well. And we try to discuss all of the relevant news every day and bring on reporters and experts and folks who know what's going on to share their perspectives, which is why we have Derek on uh, every once in a while. And always happy to have you on, man. Oh, yeah. Um, Anytime I can actually make it. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, man. So maybe now you can feel a little bit better about that iPhone or iPad. And heck, any other gadget you might use on a daily basis. Maybe some of this information can be used to be focused on letting others know about who exactly they should be contacting or how to hopefully make a difference if these issues are something important to you. To keep the theme going on the pop misinformation train, a trend lately has been popping up again surrounding the authorship of the famous plays by William Shakespeare. Just recently, there was a movie released by the name of Anonymous, which delves into the supposed fraud about Shakespeare being the actual author of the plays which had been attributed to him. To get some more information, I decided to talk to a couple experts on this very topic, Bob Blackowitz and Eve Siebert. So, Bob and Eve, since I have both of you on at the same time, I should have you take turns, introduce yourselves, so about what you do, your areas of expertise, and things like that. Yeah, um, I'm Bob Blaskowitz. I'm a a postdoc at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where I teach writing classes uh, that draw on uh, themes and skepticism and extraordinary claims. Um, I use those to teach argument. I also uh, did my dissertation on World War II veterans narratives, and I have a special interest in conspiracy theory, and even I together edit uh, Skeptical Humanities, a blog. Yeah, uh, I'm Eve Siebert. I have a PhD in English literature with uh, specializing in Old English and Middle English with secondary uh, interest in uh, Old Norse and Shakespeare. And hence why I have you on the show, because we're going to talk about it, the Shakespeare conspiracy. Mm-hmm. Can you give us a little nice summary about what some folks claim about Shakespeare and his plays? Well, briefly, since at least the 19th century, people have been arguing that someone other than Shakespeare wrote the works attributed to Shakespeare. There have been literally dozens, if not hundreds, of candidates. But the the primary ones who've been popular have been Francis Bacon, Christopher Marlowe, and now uh, the Earl of Oxford. Um, and that's the one that has appeared in the, the, movie, the movie Anonymous by Roland Emmerich. Yeah, that's, that's the more recent one, the movie itself. Yeah. It's funny because I've been 
to Stratford two or three times in my life, and I only heard about this type of thing in passing, mm -hmm. and then suddenly, more recently, it came it came popping back up to the front. And there's, <laughs> is there something that happened between now and like the past, like you know, ten, fifteen years? I think that the uh, you know Shakespeare deniers. Uh, finally scraped together funding to do a movie. I think that, that has a lot to do with it. There's been a heavy uh, uh, marketing of, of the film, uh, and they've been promoting it in uh, high school and college curricula. Um, so uh, it also there have been, uh, I think, a study program in Shakespeare authorship studies. Uh, I forget which university has it, but, but that has – lent it a, a veneer of credibility that it doesn't really have among uh, Renaissance scholars. Well, I was going to say, in the last 20 years or so, it, it's been sort of building, to a large extent, just a couple people really were behind it, someone named Charlton Ogborn. But there were two uh, mock trials, one in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, with three members of the Supreme Court, one in Britain with three law lords. Um, in both cases, they decided there wasn't sufficient evidence that Oxford wrote Shakespeare, though the Supreme Court justices have since changed their minds. Yeah. But then there was a, a, a documentary that uh, was shown on PBS's Frontline. Um, so it, and there have been things in NPR and the New York Times, so it's sort of gradually gained footholds in surprisingly respectable venues. Right. And that's kind of what surprised me, because back when I've been – to his house mm -hmm. in England, the only time I really came up a couple times when, was about um, Mark Twain's book. Right. Mm -hmm. And even then, the people there were saying they even thought it was probably just part of his, you know, tongue in cheek, this is what Mark Twain did, thinking that, you know, this is was the way he worked. You know, to him, it was like fun to make something like that. I don't know. I, he was pretty hardcore. He, in fact, published uh, someone's monograph uh, about, I think it was Bacon being the uh, yeah. the yeah. actual author of Shakespeare. So he was he was he, sinking money into it. Yeah, yeah, he seems to have been pretty serious about it. Yeah, you can actually read all of that stuff on um, Wikipedia because it, it was open sourced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I, I read through it. It's like, eh. it was hard for me to figure out if he was just being Mark Twain or just being Mark Twain with oof behind him to like further this weird idea. He seems to have been really committed to the idea um, because he thought, and, and this was fairly common at the time and it's still common, the idea that an author, all, all writing, you know, is in some way autobiographical and, and shows the inner workings of the author and, you know, rather romantic notions like that where they didn't actually know very much about Shakespeare's life and what they did know about Shakespeare's life in the 19th century, no one really liked very much. You know, he's middle class, he was interested in business, and and so someone like Bacon or Oxford was more appealing. Right. And, and I mean, you look at, at Mark Twain and so much of what he did drew on his own life, um, you know, uh, you know, on a... Uh, his travel writing and, and his uh, work on river boats. I mean, uh, you can s easily see how he might have extended that to all other authors, or in this case, just Shakespeare. You know? um, so, uh, we just talked about the the movie who, which recently came out, Anonymous, mm -hmm. and it seems that Roland Emmerich seems to have a hard on for Shakespeare because not only did the movie come out at the end of this year, he has two miniseries on TV that are coming out uh, using some of the actors from the movie Anonymous, but they're supposed to be couched in the, you know, documentary TV show stuff that's coming out um, at the end of this year. It's documentary shows? Yeah, there's what, one called Last Will and Testament, and I forget the other one, something about Anonymous something. But yeah, they're in the works right now to come out at the end of the year. Yeah, um, that was one of the, the weird things about that particular uh, troupe of actors was that they were um, fairly strongly committed uh, to the conspiracy theory. And I do think it's a, uh, a labor of love. 
at least a couple of the actors yeah. in particular. Um, Derek Jacoby, who played Derek Jacoby in the film, uh, or the prologue, and Mark Rylance, who played uh, an actor um, in the Renaissance portions of it. They're, they're both strongly behind uh, um, Doubt About Will, which is a... Uh, um, the, well, there's a declaration of doubt, reasonable uh, doubt, reasonable doubt concerning the authorship, and and they're both strongly behind that, particularly Rylance. Mm-hmm. What I find weird is that, quote unquote, reasonable doubt. There's like so much hard evidence that Shakespeare, Shakespeare actually wrote the play. Is that it's kind of funny to me that people just don't see it because yeah. just very casual research you can find many mentions by like the queen herself when she saw Shakespeare actually act out one of his plays his name was on the paperwork to you know the acting company the the globe theater I mean all these things are well documented but it's weird to me that this would actually be in question yeah it's kind of uh befuddling when you're uh, familiar with the uh the paper trail that Shakespeare left behind um, and the fact that nobody during Shakespeare's life seemed to think that he wasn't really the guy who was putting on the plays. Um, so it, it is kind of befuddling. It is uh, the product of uh, uh, a much later generation, about 150 years later, um, when they start even considering that this guy might not have been who he said he was. And there is, just to be clear, a huge amount of evidence for Shakespeare's authorship from his own lifetime and then shortly thereafter. There's a a large number of plays uh, and poems printed in his lifetime in his name. Mm -hmm. There are references to his plays. There are references to him as an author. There are references to him as an actor and an author, Mm -hmm. which is something else people complain about. There it, a mountain of evidence, much more than there is for you know the authorship of Christopher Marlowe's plays, right. for instance. Um, but the Shakespeare deniers just dismiss it somehow. It's, it's it doesn't it's register. Yeah, Shakespeare's name is spelled funny, therefore it doesn't really refer to Shakespeare. Things like um, that. Yeah. Th- how, do they have they ever taken at least a passing? course or just read about the history of language <laughs> i don't know it's it's very strange I, some i mean they have to know but there's always something else that there's always some way around it for them yeah yeah because i mean the the handwriting of that day was different than the handwriting that, that we know of now and it's changed twice since then right so and and it, spelling conventions are not quite fixed yet, not until you have real mass literacy do uh, things like, you know, dictionaries um, uh, in the modern sense uh, well, really appear uh, with proper spellings. Well, even then, I mean, let's let's pretend it's 250 years from now mm-hmm. and people pick up a book from Canada and they come up, pick one up from America and they say, well, Obviously, this is not real because they spell color different. Right. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. And even back in the in the writings in Shakespeare's day, other authors like Robert Greene and Francis Marie, uh, they were critics of his work because they were jealous of him, basically. But they wrote about that stuff, and you can actually find those old, you know, works they they exist it's it's kind of great because when you look at kind of the sniping and and backbiting of the era you you see that the that renaissance theater was was highly competitive and he was a businessman in a highly competitive area and he was very successful um yeah nothing changes i mean that's the reason why people don't like things like you know apple computers and you know bill gates and it's the same thing Mm -hmm. yeah um Mears was actually very complimentary towards Shakespeare um, and mentions him several times, uh, lists plays. Uh, That's, you know, one of the the most important. He also mentions Oxford as a writer of comedies, which Oxfordians then pick on and say, ha ha. But he also refers to Shakespeare as a writer of comedies. So 
uh, he clearly sees them as two quite separate authors. Uh, it just amazes me sometimes. Yeah. So, uh, now, the big one that makes my head kind of explode <laughs> is when somebody says, well, they, he never actually left his plays to anybody, so they probably didn't exist. Well, if you read his will, the last mentioned in the book will is that everything else goes to his daughter everything else absolutely uh, that's a, a a common mistake that that uh shakespeare deniers make uh is to say that well he didn't mention uh his plays he didn't mention his library he must have had a huge library but what they say is that because he doesn't mention the library explicitly Therefore, he didn't have a library. He, he, he didn't leave behind letters. Uh, therefore, he was illiterate and never wrote letters. Um, those are the types of kind of wild inferences that people make from, uh, well, it's the argument from ignorance. Right. And as far as the will is concerned, you're correct. He, he entailed um, his estate. So the, there are some specific bequests, but the vast majority of it goes to his daughter and then theoretically her sons, but she never had any, so then it went to his granddaughter. And the other thing is, he didn't own his plays. Right. Um, the, the theater company actually owned the plays. Um, so he wouldn't have mentioned them because, I mean, he may have had papers, but he didn't actually own the plays per se. Well, it's kind of like, you know, writers of like movie scripts and things these days. They don't own them anymore once they get bought by a production company. Right. Right. Uh, my favorite example of that was when Kurt Vonnegut, uh, he sold his, uh, the movie rights to Slaughterhouse-Five uh, to a movie studio, but he inadvertently uh, uh, sold the, the rights to Kilgore Trout uh, at the same time, and he had to buy him back for $10,000. <laughs> I love that story. Well, you see, but that's kind of, it shows you that even to this day, things work that way well it was business it, yeah there's no way around it and you know even though this was a few hundred years ago business was pretty much not much different than it is today well one important thing and we actually know a lot about um shakespeare and his contemporaries uh because of this is that that the the theaters were were regulated and were censored um, and plays had to be vetted by, you know, officials. Um, the master of the rebels. Yeah, the master of the rebels. Um, so we have a, a, a lot of official documentation about that sort of thing. And right. he officially owned, was one of the owners of the Globe Theater, and that's on the paperwork of the day as well. That's right. He was a shareholder uh, of the company. So to that extent, he, he was part owner of the plays. But the play co the company was the one who, they were using them, so... They had the plays. And also the ones that had been officially published, that also had to go through a series of steps, go, be listed with the stationer's register. And once they were published, then the, that version then belonged to the publisher. Yes. Now, yeah, because that was part of the Lord Chamberlain's company, right? Yeah, and, and later became the King's Men. After. Yeah. Now, one of the things that made my head dropped to the desk was <laughs> that the whole thing about the Supreme Court justice right. thing. And uh, you mentioned that in one of your blog posts about all the different logical fallacies that they used to like come up with this idea. Yeah, that was um, particularly John Paul Stevens. Uh, when he was still in the court, he, he came out, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that he decided and I quote, beyond reasonable doubt that Oxford wrote Shakespeare. And it was um, just the, the argument from ignorance, particularly over and over and over again. Um, he mentioned there were no books. The, the, the will doesn't mention books. The, there's no manuscripts. Um, there's no letters. And therefore, it draws the conclusion, as Bob said earlier, therefore, there weren't any books. There weren't any letters. Um, and it's a completely fallacious conclusion to make. Uh, it's, I, it's disturbing that a Supreme Court justice could, <laughs> could you know, botch analysis of evidence that badly. Well, I, the only thing I could think <laughs> of is the fact that 
there was no court trial for him to actually get information from? Well, there's that. I mean, like with with these, uh, uh, as with like any like conspiracy theory community, uh, there is, I suspect, an echo chamber effect where they just read each other constantly um, and uh, to the exclusion of the vast mountains of scholarship, in this case, of early modern England and theater history and all the other fields that lead us to the conclusion that, yes, Shakespeare was indeed that Shakespeare. Well, what's funny is that one of them mentioned somewhere that they, when they were at Shakespeare's birthplace, they said, well, they didn't see all that stuff. It's like, well, would it still be there? Yeah. There's things like museums that might want that. <sighs> yeah. And, yeah. and things like that just boggle my mind that, you know, it's that argument from authority mm -hmm. that people fall into all the time. You'd also be surprised how many people have wanted to dig up uh, Shakespeare's grave or his memorial because for some reason they're convinced that the, the evidence is hidden there. The why it would be buried with the guy who didn't write the plays, I'm not sure. Yeah, and, and it's funny because I believe his, his gravestone says, don't touch my bones. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Just insult to injury, really. It's just bizarre. And what's really disheartening to me as a skeptic, when I went on Robin, Rotten Tomatoes just to see what people think, thought about as anonymous, mm -hmm. is the fact that the people who were there usually are fairly decent. They liked anonymous, and the comments were pretty much pro conspiracy, conspiracy theory about the, the film. Which is impressive because that's a hell of a conspiracy theory Ugh. in that film because it's it's it involves uh, incest and, and hidden children and yeah. and it's I mean the movie itself is only sort of a disaster. Uh, it's very pretty. Yeah. Um, I I would give out a special Academy Award for the beards and mustaches because they are phenomenal. <laughs> um, but the way that the movie is is put together uh, in terms – it's told in flashes forward and flashes back, um, and the characters don't seem to age at the same rate. Um, so it's very hard to tell when you are and who you're looking at um, at any given time. Uh, it was – from that perspective, it was it was – just as confusing as the actual conspiracy theory. I mean, you could look at it and, and say that it's a symptom of, of muddled thought. It's certainly the product of a disordered mind. <laughs> but um, uh, we were when we were there uh, in, in the theater watching the movie, um, it was a late afternoon show, and there were two little old ladies in front of us. Um, and they had been to the earlier show, but the theater had lost power um, about halfway through, and so they had to come back. And as we were walking out, fetching about what we'd just seen, uh, they said that they were glad that they come back because they didn't understand what was happening the first time through. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's I – mean, I haven't seen the movie, so mm. I'm not sure it's on my – Can't you know, recommend it. Netflix yeah. must-see list, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's – it's, it hurts so good. It's, it's like an Ed Wood movie, you know, <laughs> just really expensive. Yeah. Wow. Well, where can people find out more about the things you we just discussed? Because you guys have a cup a blog that you both um, contribute to, and you did a lot of posts about this topic and many others. So, it gives people a, an idea about you know where you can find all that information and things that you guys write about. Because you know I know both of you are pretty much part of the skeptic community, so you talk about this type of thing all the time. Uh, well. Our blog is skepticalhumanities.com, um, and yet, as you say, we've written about Shakespeare quite a lot. Yeah, it was actually the reason why we started up, um, uh, or at least the, the impetus behind the first couple of posts was yeah. that this uh, anonymous movie was in production, and this will not stand. <laughs> you know? So, um, and, and also, part of what we want to do on the site is to uh, promote the idea that the humanities are... Uh, an area where people have genuine expertise, um, where we also uh, build up arguments based on evidence, just like, um, you know, skeptics like. Um, and we want to raise the profile of the humanities among the skeptical community. So, 
and I think you've done that a few times in the past at the Dragon Con Skep Track as well. So if anybody <laughs> ever goes there, they can usually we have one panel that Bob puts together about this very topic. Yep, absolutely. Um, we we had a Massimo Piliucci. There are a number of high profile uh, uh, skeptics who have uh, background in the humanities. Massimo Piliucci, uh, Joe Nicola has a PhD in literature. Um, Karen Stolzno. Uh, uh, is a linguist, a PhD linguist. Um, there, there are uh, any number of practicing uh, members of the humanistic community uh, <laughs> who are also skeptics. It's not just about the DNA and space and rockets. It's, there's, a, there's other things out there. Mm-hmm. So also you guys are part of the IIG Atlanta group along with me. Mm-hmm. And uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on with uh, the IIG Atlanta, and also IIG is uh, not actually is it international? It is, it's it's a, a it's a national group at this point, but they're expanding, I think, into Canada. Yeah, international. They're working on uh, possibly two in Canada. Yeah, the, uh, the Independent Investigations Group. Um, we're like the ghost hunters, but with self-respect. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we respect uh, the scientific method, um, and we're interested in claims of the the paranormal and supernatural and otherwise extraordinary. Um, We offer a $50,000 prize uh, for uh, the claimant who can successfully, under controlled conditions, uh, demonstrate uh, supernatural powers like a psychic or an iridologist. Dowser. Dowsers, yeah. Um, And uh, we work to... uh, put on events in the Atlanta area uh, and raise the profile of skepticism in the community. And also if you find somebody who does pass the first test by the IIG, there's an, there's a, uh, a money prize. And then there's a, uh, some form of uh, collaboration with the uh, JREF as well, right? That's right. Um, we count as a clearing house, a, a first round for the JREF million dollar uh, challenge. Yeah, so if you win our $50,000, then you can try to go win uh, the JREF's $1 million. You don't have to do that that first test to get there. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so if you uh, if you think you can glow in the dark or tell lies based on holding an Easter egg mm-hmm. or anything like that, find your local IIG and uh, see if you can win some money and then go on a mil win a million and there is also a five thousand dollar finder's fee for someone who uh nominates a a successful claimant for the fifty thousand dollar prize oh so if you don't know how to dull lies with an easter egg you know somebody's (laughs) child who can exactly okay absolutely can like make some money at this Mm -hmm. try to incentive incentivize the clientele uh well hey that's that usually that works Yep. We have a, a something in the in the works now that was actually brought to us by a uh, uh, a fan of a certain psychic. Um, we are working out those details now. Hopefully, something will come of it. Um, we'd love to do the test. Well, if something happens with that, we'll have you back on to talk about the results and how that happened. Great. Thank you so much for jumping on the show. Thanks for having us. I once again thank all the guests who took the time to come on the show for this episode. Before I leave, there's one announcement I have here at Skepticality. Over the past couple weeks, we've had a lot of people requesting more information about the intro song we play at the beginning of each episode. There's now a link off the main website at Skepticality.com where you can find out more about the song and even help support the show by grabbing a copy of the full version of the song for your own library. As always, you can find links to everything we talked about on this episode in the show notes at our website, skepticality.com. Join our discussion forums at www.skepticality.com. Leave feedback by email at feedback at skepticality.com or by phone at area code 206-888-8888.
hoax. That's 206-888-4629. This has been Skepticality. Thanks for listening.